All right, hello everyone. Um, uh, welcome back from lunch break. Um, and um, yeah, let the controversy begin. Um, uh, the, um, I'm Olivier, I'm uh, the editor of Gin Foundry. Uh, I'm going to talk to you guys all a bit uh, about uh, going grain to glass. Um, I, um, uh, I know that we're doing a uh, tasting uh, of um, a different uh, base spirits in a second, and Joanne will be taking over to do a little bit more talk about flavor. So I'm really going to be focusing on um, what it's actually involved for those who are going grain to glass and the production of it, um, why it's so hard to do, um, what does it actually mean if we were to enforce the rules that we currently uh, have in place? Um, that's a very different fact to what currently goes on versus what currently should be allowed to go on. Um, what the workaround is for those making base spirits and looking to be creative with their, um, with their, with their base uh, alcohol. And why it's important to support um, those who are going grain to glass in the UK. Um, uh, I've been seeing a lot of collateral and pamphlets and stuff like that uh, with my name saying grain to glass, why bother? I should probably just come straight off the fence and say I am a huge advocate for those going for greater glass. It's been a massive focus for us on Gin Foundry, and I will continue to uh, place uh, an, a, a focus on them for the next 12 months. I really hope that there would be more grain to glass producers in the UK than there currently are today. Um, right, so it's a trend that's years in the making, and when I say a trend, not really. Uh, it's not really happening that much. It's not, there's not that many more grain-to-glass producers, proportionally speaking, than there are distillers taking, growing. There are, of course, more grain-to-glass producers in the last 18 months than we've ever seen before emerge, but the reality is so there's many more distilleries that have emerged um, over the past 18 months than we've ever seen before. So proportionally speaking, we're still talking about 10 to 1, really, when you start looking about new rectifiers and new distillers coming on board for those who are, going a grain to, who are making a grain-to-glass gin. So it's quite few and far between, and it kind of makes sense. And from all of the stories that we've tracking, it's been great to see uh, so many faces and familiar faces now launched uh, their gins that we uh, at Gin Foundry get the privilege to see before they launch and track their stories for months and even years before they launch. Um, and one of the things that I find with grain to glass producers um, is that that journey and that trajectory takes about three years. Uh, on average, two and a half to three years. When you start thinking, oh, how long was it for me to open my distillery? For most rectifiers, it's about nine to 18 months. And within a year and a half, they're up and running. That's very, very rarely the case. And all of the new ones that you're seeing come onto the scene today have actually been working at it for at least two years before it's come to this point. So it's not really a trend that's in the making, um, but it is something that you're seeing more and more. But this idea and this focus around what, is, makes, what makes a base spirit, what makes and um, the flavors of it is becoming more and more apparent within trade distillers and that conversation is increasing uh, at a phenomenal rate currently and we're seeing more questions about what base spirit, what, what, what does it involve and how do you actually make it and does it important and, and all of these facets. Um, one of the things I would just like to get, get, get down and dirty, there's really the sexy stuff of the EU laws. Um, and when you go into Annex 1, um, just, to, uh, just to point out, uh, when you go into Annex 1, uh, ethyl alcohol of agricultural origin possesses the following properties, a minimum alcoholic strength of 96. And this is the thing that I get consistently in my inbox, consistently, is people going, oh, you know what, it has to start off at 96, and then it can trail off. No, the minimum heart cut is 96. It's pretty black, it's on black and white, or white on blue, whatever you want to uh, have a look today. Um, but that's in Annex 1, when it just states the words, well, this is what ethyl alcohol of agricultural origin is. It has to be of, it had to have been distilled to a minimum of 96. And when it comes to gin, and again, this is where people start getting really creative and wordsmithing around what they're allowed to do. It's only distilled gin that's 96, isn't it? It's only London Dry that's 96. It doesn't actually say it in gin that you don't have to go... Does it? It does. They're saying the same thing. When you look at, um, when you look at gin, it says a juniper flavored spirit drink produced flavoring organoleptically suitable ethyl alcohol of agricultural origin, i.e., refer to Annex 196. It just happens to restate it in the distilled gin section and in the London Dry section. So all of those brands that are hoodwinking consumers and other trade into thinking it's only London Dry and distilled gin that needs to be 96 are just lying to you. Um, and as an industry, we should be tightening up on and calling them out on it. No, if you want to be calling it gin, you should have a base that has been distilled to 96. Now, 
question is whether those rules should change, and that's a whole different debate, but that is currently the state of play at the moment. And the reason that I'm being a stickler for this 96 point is that 96 is really bloody hard to do, right? Um, and uh, when you start, and that's a big reason why there are so few who are going grain to glass and doing their own base spirit. It's really hard. Um, you've got to look at it as the expertise and know-how. You don't have to be a rectifier. You've got to be a brewer. You've got to ferment. You've got to rectify. You've got to drive it all up. The expertise and know-how is much harder to achieve right off the bat. Therefore, fewer people go into it. That makes sense. Uh, the scale of it, on an, like to make it commercially viable, you've got to go big. You know, I've, uh, I can't reveal all of the numbers that I'm privy to, but when I go into some of these distilleries, they're from wash to end spirit. They're making sometimes 12 parts of wash to make one, le one part of end spirit. That phenomenal reduction over time. You need to start big, distill big, in order to be able to make this commercially and actually achieve that. So, and then that's just one of the reasons why you scale up as well in terms of actually being able to drive the spirit, etc. I'm trying to go fast through this so that I can fit um, some of the ramifications and repercussions later on. But um, scale, the distillery needs to be bigger. This is Ramsbury at the bottom. You can see just how big they're brewing and fermenting. You need space. You need apparatus to be bigger. Top right is Renegade from Doghouse Distillery in Battersea. Um, and so all of this, setup costs, expertise, know-how, costs you money loads more money. Um, and that's why so few are going into it currently. And that's something to be respected. But it actually doesn't just cost you money to set up and get going. It costs you money to keep running. Because for every one batch of gin you make, you need to make a batch of uh, vod vodka first. And then, then you need to do it. So it just takes you longer. And then it has this compounding effect as to why it is a harder product to do and going grain to glass. And those who do it should be admired and respected for the uh, effort and endeavor that they put into it. Um, I just wanted to point out, this is a, um, to go to 95 is hard work. To go to 96 requires a disproportionate amount of effort to hit that extra 1%. This is not, and this is a, a, a drawing and an illustration of a Muller uh, pot still. Uh, it's a 2,000 pot, a litre pot still on the right, a uh, little gin still on the left, but it goes through the columns. And they were doing the tests, because uh, this is for a client out in uh, Australia for them. And uh, they were going through the test, going to go grape to glass. Um, and on 15 plates, it is possible to hit 95. It's not easy. Whether the spirit is OK or not is questionable. But to hit 96, they, it's not just oh, a couple of extra plates here and there. They needed to go up to 35. And then they still need to do two distillations in order to achieve it. So that extra 1% is about 42,000 euro. That's the difference it makes in terms of apparatus and cost. When you start looking at it, it to hit 95 is not the same economic barrier to hit 96. It's a huge difference. Uh, and it's not just the amount of copper that you need and the amount of plates. It's how you run your still. The apparatus, the process, and the maker, all of these things are big factors that play into each other. So you can't just say, hey, I've got a massive thing. I've invested in all the money. I can just run it and press play and go. It doesn't work that way. Actually, the pace at which you run it, the, the requirements you're doing, it, how many times you're distilling it, the, the type of wash that you're doing, all of that starts playing a, a big factor. And that's why it's really hard to achieve the 96 and why you see so few in the UK make it in comparison to in the US or into, in Australia, where there are many more people going to their base spirit. And the reason for that is that they don't need to go to 96. They go to 95. So if we were to say, OK, we have the rule. We understand that there's a difference between hitting 95 and 96. We have the rules that clearly state it, that you need to hit 96. If we were to enforce that today, what would that mean? That would actually mean that at least a dozen of uh, European products would have to be removed. Now, I'm putting the ones uh, here up on the board who are super, uh, incredibly transparent about what they're doing and how they're doing it. And uh, for example, Vorgin. Uh, on the left there is Icelandic. It's a pot distilled gin. They make a new make spirit, uh, kind of high 80s, redistill it um, with juniper berries, uh, and it is a gin. Not by the letter of the law it isn't. Is it, does it taste like gin? Yes. Is it a fantastic product? Yes. Does it, is it brilliant? Yes. Do I absolutely love drinking it? Yes. Is it gin on a label if we were to enforce the rule? No. Um, uh, USA only requires distillers to hit 95. Uh, and so many people who make their own base spirit and those who go grain to glass would have to be removed from the EU market. Um, look at Death's Door, look at Koval, look at the guys at 23rd Street distilling down in Australia. They're not going to 96 because they do not need to. They openly state on their websites 190 proof. So what are we then going to say, 
You know what, the category is better off for not having them? Of course not. They are fantastic gins that imbue their provenance, that imbue their passion into every single drop that goes into their bottle, but by EU law, currently shouldn't be on our, on, on our shelves. Um, so do the rules need to change? It's a question I don't know the answer to, but I think it's something that we need to be considering because when we talk about how much juniper is too much juniper and how we do this, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There are all rules pretty much systematically that are never enforced. So what's the point in having these rules when, uh, the, when you're saying, okay, well, because they taste like gin and they're great products, we're going to be okay with it. They're great. That's fine. But you can't have a double standard. You either have a rule that you adhere to or you don't have the rule at all. Unfortunately, that's the reality of where we're at right now. Um, but so it begs the question, do we then go, do we have one global standard that everyone goes to and we all go to 95? Maybe that's lowering the barrier too much. Maybe that's not the right way. Maybe we go London dry gin is 96, distilled gin is 95, there's no rule for compounds. I don't know what the answer is, but I'm just suggesting at the moment we have rules that we don't enforce and that are pretty much unenforceable given we've been letting it go out the door and the horse has already bolted for the best part of a decade. Um, also, if you were to lower the barrier to entry, for as much as that might be a controversial idea, and again, I'm not proposing that we do that, I'm just suggesting that it's something that you can't just bat off, uh, uh, bat, uh, right off, would it allow more innovation to be done in terms of apparatus being used? You know, we're seeing a lot of eye stills being used at the moment, and sure, they might be able to get up to 96, but as a minimum of 96, a lot of the people who are using them aren't using them and driving in and using to that a bit to that level, and therefore, Potentially, would we see a lot more innovation in the distilling sector, in terms of the still sector, some of these vacuum hybrids that we're seeing come in from Carl, from Holstein, from Muller, from Cote, they're all coming in and they're all creating new apparatus that would change it. If you were to say, hey, make it 95, would that lead to more adoption of it? Would that lead to more, I don't know. Um, but there is something to be said about potentially tweaking about, and, uh, tweaking about the rules. But if you were to do so, a fair warning, the consequences are much broader than just saying, oh, it's fine for those who go grain to glass. Um, so it, it's something that would need to be considered and, and debated at length before anything could be done about it. Um, if you think it's not that common, um, here's my inbox for the last 10 days, and my thanks to Nicholas for allowing me to, um, uh, to, to update uh, my slides so that you could see here on, was it June 7th, what's been coming in, in my inbox in, uh, uh, since the beginning of June. Um, there are lots of people who don't use a highly rectified base spirit, uh, or don't want to, or have an interest in, in trying to infuse it. You start looking at Copenhagen Dry Gin, that was in box for, for, a, for a pitch on, on what they're doing uh, later this month, uh, redistilled mead with juniper berries, copper in kings, that's redistilled brandy with juniper berries. Um, you're looking at Borovica, it's a Slo Slovak juniper, they're not calling it gin, but they're saying they would be better off if they could call it gin, because it's a juniper brandy. Um, and of course, Ornebrack from from uh, Ireland, Ornebrack incidentally do go to 96. And I've checked and I've looked and they've had to customize their pot still to add added reflux, but it's a single malt gin made on a pot still. It's has an incredible piece of apparatus. And that's what I'm talking about, that innovation within the distilling sector. Perhaps we could see more of that and see more people challenge your convention of what you understand and what you believe to be impossible. Because when I saw that, I was like, no way is that feasible going to 96. And then they showed, look at the photos, look at how it's done and you see it and you're like, well, bravo, because that, that's the hats off. But I'm just saying it's not that uncommon within the market and it's increasing rapidly. Um, and so potentially now is the time to talk about it because um, when you look at the workaround and how people are working around base spirits going, okay, well, I respect the 96 rule. How do you work around it? Um, you can do what Foxhole do or do what uh, Boatyard Double Gin does. Um, and um, they mix NGS with their own base spirit. So in the case of Foxhole, they make a mark. They use that as a liquid botanical. Um, same thing with uh, the team at uh, Boatyard. They kind of create their, I would say, new make spirit that's highly rectified, not to 96, add it to NGS, and you get all of that maltiness through the flavor. They're all great products. They're just using part and part. So there's easy ways around it. So, and maybe that makes the argument that the rules don't need to change. If you want to do something different, just mix half and half. Um, of course, going 
before distillation isn't the only way that you can approach this. You can go post distillation too. And there are loads of examples like Jin Zhu adding sake afterwards or Jinabel with a Mirabel plum eau de vie afterwards, Ferdinand Saar with the wine. There are loads of people who do infusions afterwards in order to be able to get that base spirit. So it is not just a case, there are already pretty easy workarounds to get around the rules and regulations in place. It doesn't necessarily mean that we need new rules and regulations. Right. Uh, why is it important to talk about that base uh, and that base spirit uh, and just base spirit? One, there are amazing products being made. Uh, and when I start looking at it, um, where there's craft, there needs to be support, uh, understanding and respect. And actually, uh, otherwise, no one will bother doing it. If, you, if we, uh, as communicators, enthusiasts, commentators, and educators, don't try and educate people about actually what goes on before we can rectify, and we don't value and support it and celebrate it, nobody else is going to bother doing it. And there's a, at the moment, sure, the rules are make it difficult in the UK for us uh, to compete. There are far more people in the US and in Australia who make their own base spirit. Um, but if we could support them a little bit more, potentially we might see more of it. Um, it's great for consumer and trade education. We start talking about process and distillation, and I think last time I was on saying, we've got to stop talking about process and distillation. Uh, let's talk about the artistry involved in making something. But if you are going to talk about process and distillation, this is a really good tool to talk about, because it starts off with a piece of barley or a grape or a sugar cane or a potato, and it goes right the way through the process. And it's a brilliant way of being able to explain to people, look, this is how the booze is made. Um, and this is actually where it's from, literally, not just plucked from of somewhere or this kind of wider idea. It is literally from a location. Um, yeah, it's a great way of getting new flavors and innovation. Um, you don't necessarily need shimmer when your base spirit is doing all of the shining for you, right? Um, it's a great way of creating new flavors, new ideas, regionality, seasonality, uh, provenance, uh, imbuing all of these things that you as distillers do already, but in a way that feels a little bit more authentic than the next bubble, bu bubble gum pink uh, shimmer liquid coming through. So I don't know, there's something there in which there's an opportunity for those who want to pursue it, uh, and certainly uh, something we should look at uh, uh, more closely as a category. Um, uh, what are the implications of this trend, um, other than actually an understanding that base gin and base spirits make a difference? Um, uh, I think it blows the argument over what craft is and what craft means even further apart. My gin's handcrafted, supercrafted, world wind crafted. Like, hi, you know, I, we craft every element out of it. It's humans that do it. Great, well done. Um, but when you talk about scale, process, and provenance, and most consumers, they think small. They think small. They think small. They think small. Whereas actually, if you're talking about craft vodka. You actually need to be thinking quite big. You know, it challenges people's preconceptions. And all of a sudden, is someone's gin because you've rectified it more craft than the person who's made it from scratch? I don't know. I'm not going to make a declare. I'm not going to declare where I'm at on that one. But it certainly changes the consumer perception as to what is craft and what isn't craft in a way that fundamentally changes the game. And what does that change primarily is price points. Currently. Um, I feel that grain-to-glass gins anchor the gin scene and the, uh, and the gin price points uh, to, uh, as opposed to elevator. And they set a ceiling at the moment that others will find hard to justify. When you look at all of those products I had on the board, the majority of them are under 35 quid. So when you have a craft gin in a 500 ml bottle that is 45, 50 pounds, 65 pounds, I'm seeing some of these ones now, and you're going, hang on a minute, you're just rectifying. These guys who are going from scratch are 28 pounds. For consumers who then have a reallocation or a, re a, new, a different perception of what it means to be, all of a sudden, your price point gets challenged. And if they're super cheap, then does that block us uh, as a gin community to command higher prices? Or if we were to celebrate them, and w would they be able to elevate their prices in order for everybody else underneath it to also do so the same way? I don't know what the answer is, but fundamentally, the more the grain to glass producers, uh, the more grain to glass producers there are in the UK, the more that perception will change, and the more your price, or price tag will be challenged as a result. What are you doing to justify that price? Um, Lastly, we're in the botanical spirits game. Um, and uh, at the moment, it'd be really interesting to see what 
Ben has to say later in terms of more products doesn't necessarily mean cannibalization. I'm not suggesting that all of a sudden, because more people are fermenting, brewing, and creating their own eau de vies, their own base vodkas, that it's going to cannibalize on gin sales. I'm not suggesting that. I think there is a thirst for botanical spirits and white spirits in particular. And if things like Pear Brandy, Kirsch, Calvados, Cotswoldsvados, um, or whatever it is that comes, uh, comes in. Protect, my question is, if we pursue as a gin category the liquid shimmer, and these guys are doing something authentic and true to provenance and true to this idea of terroir and, agro and where their locality is, will the natural interest also shift um, to a different category that has more, has a different, that is perceived to be more authentic? Whether it is or isn't, isn't the matter. It's what it's perceived to be. And the more, again, the more these kind of grain to glass distillers happen, the more you will see that shift in, uh, in perception and this shift in consumer purchasing habits happen as a result. Um, I wanted to race through that really quickly uh, so that I was on time that I just, I was about to go red. Uh, okay, great. Um, so that you can see it. But, um, uh, you know, w w one thing I just want to say is just to, 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 to recognize where, where craft is, to celebrate it, to support it, to challenge those who are claiming to do grain to glass but aren't actually doing it. There are a lot of people out there who do that. You'd be amazed the minute you start scratching the surface. Do you actually make your own? Do you add NGS? Do you not? Phenomenal amount. So please challenge it because the people who do go there, who have the expertise and know-how, who have done the investment, who are helping educate and uh, educate the category, need your support in order to do that better. All right. Thanks very much.